This is Khat Chronicles, design stories from the Arab world. My name is Yasmin Nashabi Ta'an, and I have with me today Lina Hakim, a Lebanese researcher, senior lecturer, and artist. Lina is particularly interested in overlaps between the material cultures of science, technology, craft, and play. She taught design, history, and theory uh, courses in Lebanon and the UK. She now teaches critical and historical studies to graphic design students at Kingston University in London. She was an Andrew Mellon postdoctoral research fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum, where she co-coordinated the VNA Research Institute pilot project. Hi, Lina. Hi, Yasmin. How are you? <laughs> Fine. How are you? Great good, to have thanks. you with us today. Great to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so maybe I, I'm thinking maybe we can maybe you can start by telling us what brought you into research because that's the focus of our you know interview <laughs> today. <laughs> What brought me into research? Uh, a very long and convoluted route, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I started, as you know, I started by studying, uh, um, you know, in terms of um, after school, I started by studying graphic design at AUB, at the American University of Beirut. I then um, did an MA in book art, which was a practice-based MA at Canberra College of Arts in London, after which I came back to Beirut did a bit of teaching and decided I wanted to study some more. <laughs> um, did an MRes in Humanities and Cultural Studies, uh, <laughs> which was followed by a PhD also in Humanities and Cultural Studies, and somehow went full circle into applying um, all of the research that I did, which was on, um, oh, on material culture, I think, generally, on, on ways of thinking about things, on ways of thinking about making, went into teaching. Um, history and theory to design students. So I kind of came back to design through a, a long and convoluted way. Not not sure where this where this path is <laughs> path is leading next either. You had a long path, Lena. <laughs> <laughs> not a very efficient one, uh, but an interesting one. Yes, definitely. So design thinking, when you know, this is uh, these are terms that we're using uh, in our. In design pedagogy, I have to say, every day. So what do, what, and sometimes I'm thinking, what do we mean by design thinking? What does design uh, thinking adds to the <laughs> education of a designer? I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. I actually don't use the term design thinking, but I think a lot about what we're teaching when we're teaching design students, particularly what we're teaching when we're teaching design history, what we're teaching when we're teaching design theory. Um, and what use it is to creative practitioners. Um, you know, thinking about design or graphic design taken as broadly as possible. I'm, I mainly teach graphic design students at Kingston, um, but I'm always, I really enjoy how expansive they are and their definition and their understanding of design. So what I've started doing, because I teach across the, I coordinate the program across three years, so across the whole undergraduate degree. Um, I've started thinking about implementing this into teaching or teaching and learning, I guess, into this kind of dialogue with students so that we're thinking from the beginning about how we understand design. What do we understand by the discipline? How do we define the discipline? What are our references if we're thinking in terms of history? What kind of constitutes the canon? Who are, who are the main people we think about when we think about um, graphic design? What are the practices we think about when we think about graphic design and what gets left off? And, and what I say to the students in first year is that this is the question that we'll be going back to through the next three years so that in, uh, by the end of third year, it's a three-year program, you're able to um, articulate your understanding um, of graphic design as a practitioner, your location within a community of practice, I guess, and what you would, um, I guess, your hopes for graphic design as a field and as a practice, you know, what you'd like to do with this. Um, so I get them to think a lot about citizenship and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think this this is what interests me, I think, about teaching yeah. design, history, and theory. Yeah, this is really interesting that you're mentioning this, and I'm thinking about my students in Beirut and then your students in London, and I really <laughs> want to hear more about the reaction of the students in London about these this approach in, uh, you know, speaking about design in general. 
And, and now I'm thinking about the project that you have done, this amazing project that you have done, the book on Dia al Azawi. <laughs> So the uh, Lina wrote a book about Dia al Azawi that was that was published by uh, Khat, uh, it's uh, Khat Books, and uh, the book's title is Dia al Azawi: Taking a Stand, Activism Through Graphic Design. Dia al Azawi is a renowned Iraqi uh, contemporary artist whose graphic design work is largely docu- undocumented. I mean, his work as an artist is very much available and visible, but the, his work as a graphic designer is not. So I guess the book was there to somehow fill this gap. Uh, and so maybe, I don't know if I may say this, and maybe you can tell us more about you know, the challenges of writing such a book on a, uh, you know, a renowned figure in the Arab region. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I'm very happy. To, I'm always happy to talk about this book. I have to say that this is part of the um, Arabic uh, graphic design library. Is that what the collection is called by Hot Books? And I think the project in itself is um, is just yeah, you know, just to, as you know, it's a it's a really um, uh, um, important project. I think it's an essential project because it brings to light examples of design practice that are less visible usually. Um, uh, obviously, the focus is in particular on the Arab world. I actually um, was approached by Huda, by Huda uh, Smithhausen Abi, Abi Faris about the project. Um, she said, you're in London, you're a researcher, <laughs> you understand graphic design, you read in Arabic. Uh, Dia is in London, <laughs> you should uh, meet him and let's see what we can do about this. And the project was actually much, um, in many ways, much easier than it would have been because as well as being uh, an amazing artist and an amazing um, designer, Dia is also a very meticulous archivist of his own work and also of work in the region. So he's, a, he's collected um, items of you know posters, items of designs, books, etc., uh, by himself and by others. He's um, uh, as much as possible kept detailed records, including dates when they were made, things like that. Um, He's also a very prolific writer um, on design and design practice, even if it's not necessarily described as such. So, for example, he would have written about um, poster making in the Arab world, or he would have been writing about particular uh, uses of letter forms or particular relationships of image and text and things like that. And, And what I found most interesting about the project was trying to bring this up so remember, we were talking about what our references are when we think about graphic design or the references or um, the theories, you know, how we define the discipline. What I found, what I thought would be mo- most interesting is to keep or to put forward the, the local understanding, you know, the way in which that practice was understood by the practitioners at the time, instead of imposing um, definitions from the way, you know, we've studied it, which is, you know, following the Western uh, canon and definitions. And I thought... Um, Highlighting, I guess, um, his voice, highlighting um, uh, uh, the kind of critical frameworks within which they were working. These kinds of things were, I mean, I think it was for me a lesson in how histories get recorded, how histories of practice get recorded and get understood. So, yeah, I really enjoyed the project. I mean, it was a, it was a very big learning curve and I enjoyed writing it, but I, I enjoy writing generally. I mean, I just wish I had more time for it. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, I totally understand you. I'm, I'm I'm thinking about, you know, this 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 the fact that you've you've been unfortunate fortunate that the the archive is there, so the work yes. was there for Dia. But then I think the book. So then you're thinking what the book is in a way a compilation of his work, um, you know, the poster production that he had done. But then it's also making sense of the archive. It's also, you know, looking into the archive and trying to make sense of it. And so maybe you can tell us a bit about the addition of how you know, the approach that you've used in writing the book or in doing this research or in using uh, the material, the interviews within the book or, you know, like yeah. the, the, maybe the method that you've used in terms of compiling. Yeah, uh, definitely. Material. Well, there were there we had a few conversations, so there were quite a few recordings which I could um, draw really um, evocative, I think, quotes from. Um, but I think it was more of um, stepping back and doing. Um, a friend of mine calls it feet on the radiator thinking. 
to kind of <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to, to to picture all of the stuff in your in your um, mind and try to think about how they fit together. And I think in terms of um, I think the way I ended up organizing the book is the way in which I felt f- things fell into place. So there was a bit of a reflection on, um, well, a bit, a lot of uh, a reflection on um, identity, uh, which is um, which is a big question at the time um, that the art was practicing. I'm just going to pull out the book just to have a quick scan of my table of contents. <laughs> oh, that's the copy with um, was a drawing by the art, and it's just really beautiful. It's a it's a bird. And his name to dedication. Um, yeah, so so the first one, the first section was about figuration of identity, and what I what I um, collated in there were ideas around heritage and tradition, which were very much debated in artistic circles, particularly in Iraq, but in the region at the time, um, especially in relation to um, well, in Iraq, in relation to a heritage that goes back, you know, to Mesopotamian Iraq, etc ideas around the epic, ideas around tragedy, things that are particular to the uh, things that have to do with um, motifs, visual motifs, these kinds of resonant things, um, but also this idea of bearing witness, which is something that really recurs in his practice and that kind of, I think, undercuts most of his work. So this idea of preserving memory, I guess. Um, the second section was a lot more um, formal in terms of drive. So I looked at this relationship between image and text but it's not just about formal explorations with the uh, I mean a lot of it has to do with how important literature literature is storytelling but also literature is uh, poetry as um, um, uh, communal listening and communal uh, story making um, and how that fits into ideas around contemporary um, artistic expression and then in the third section um, I looked uh, more broadly at, um, I guess, design and application, if you want. Um, so his cultural and political engagement, um, you know, work on magazines, works on the poster, works on uh, dissemination, organizing exhibitions, fairs, um, a lot of it with political intent, so a lot of support for the Palestinian cause, of course, um, for, um, you know, the global south, that kind of thing, poster making the global south, ideas around resistance, etc. But also ideas around promotion, so promotion of artistic practice, design practice, again, in the region, uh, broader Arab world, etc. Yeah, I mean, it's making me think about this need that we have to learn, to look more and to learn more about what is happening or what had happened in terms of, I don't know, print material, for example, in, you know, the global south or... And, and how we can learn from it in terms of, of uh, not just the visual culture that is different, but if I may say, I mean, you know, that it, it could be different, it could be uh, similar uh, uh, in different instances, but also the way the practice, the way these designers in the 50s and the 60s practice design in a different way. If, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think I think there's a lot to learn yeah, as you say, from the global south more generally. I mean, I find um, Latin American examples of um, oh, yeah. design pedagogy really interesting and, yeah. and somehow closer to our, and I'm saying our, I mean, I know I'm teaching in the UK, but I mean our, as Arabs, as Lebanese people maybe, uh, our um, sensitivity towards yeah. these kinds of ideas and that kind of learning and that kind of practice. Yeah, and, um, and, and Dia Azawi's book was mostly about activism, so maybe you can tell us a bit about this. Yeah, I mean, I'm angle. I'm not sure he'll ag- he'll agree, <laughs> but mm-hmm. I felt that that what um, uh, uh, grouped these three key sections or these cre- key notions is um, is this sense of an engaged practice, if you want. Um, so this idea of taking a stand, taking a position in relation to um, uh, the celebration of identity and registration of memory. Uh, taking a stand in terms of uh, um, foregrounding the relationship of image and text, and then and then literal, I would I would say um, activism in terms of um, his engagement with cultural practices more broadly. Mm. Um, so that that's what I mean. I mean, obviously, there's also political engagement, but I just meant, you know, engaged art has a bad rep, or engaged design has a bad rep. But I I think taking a stand is really essential, and I think. I think this sense of citizenship, global citizenship, as he would be the first to um, <laughs> insist I, uh, on, I think, um, 
is uh, is essential to his practice. He talks about human heritage. You know, he talks about you know he'd say you know Iraqi, he'd say uh, Mesopotamian, he'd say Arab. Uh, but when he talks about Gilgamesh, for instance, he'd say yes, it's you know it's our human heritage. It's universal. <laughs> it belongs to all of us. Um, and yeah. I think it's something he's very sensitive to and very aware of. And, and you know, I hope it comes across in, in the book. It does. And, you know, this this initial idea that you spoke about at the beginning, uh, you know, this uh, the, the, the this notion of identity that always comes up in design work. I mean, mm. yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should move forward to start uh, thinking <laughs> along another interest that you had that is uh, the uh, the way design uh, uh, is it comes across uh, uh, research on science and art i mean i don't know mm. if you want to talk a bit about this another uh, yeah i'm I'm, ha- <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy to i mean this is this this i guess takes me back a bit uh, to my um mres and phd research um where i was i mean the title of my phd was scientific playthings and I was interested in how um, um, engaging with, well, on, on relationships, if you want, with um, explorative science, experimental science, scientific research, and play with material objects. Um, and, and that's where that interest started. I mean, I'm really interested in play and theories of play generally. I'm really interested in objects and the way we use them to make sense of the world, to make sense of ourselves, um, and to play. <laughs> Um, and, um, and yeah, I think, I think what you're referring to is this article that I, um, a chapter in this book edited by Leslie Atman that's just out, I think, um, called Science and Design, um, where I wrote about meaning making in design and science, um, taking, um, an instrument, a, a wonderful, um, instrument called the Crookes radiometer, um, as a case study to kind of unpack the way in which these these come into play to, to unpack um, relationships between science, design, and, and meaning making. The, there's so much to write about in terms of research and design. I mean, I really I'm thinking. So maybe we can, maybe maybe now I'm thinking. So what is the importance of research in you know in, <laughs> you know how important is research in relation to design? You know, this is a question that ah. my students sometimes bring up in class you know, yeah. they're like yeah but we're we're designers we make things <laughs> we'd rather make things than than do research but then research is part of it i think i don't know if you i think so i mean i think now. you know yeah making and thinking i think are entirely interlinked i always find um i've got the way in which the um, university structure that kingston uh, means that um, colleagues in my department teach across different courses and I always feel particularly um, lucky to be teaching graphic design students because I think they're some of the ones that um, most uh, readily understand the relationship between research and practice. I think they're always very aware of so- something that has to do with the, a bit of a lack of definition, I think, um, in the field. Something that has to do with the fact that it it has to be. I mean, it's always interdisciplinary. You're always working. It's always collaborative, right? It's always um, involved with exploring new platforms, with looking at new ways of doing things. It's not just about communication. It's not just about information. It's not just about storytelling. It can be about all of these things, and it can be about you know more or less. Um, I, I find that they're very open to the idea. I mean, what we do again with um, with the program, I was saying we start thinking from the beginning, you know, what what is graphic design? What is a graphic designer? Um, what we do in second year is we start thinking, well, what kind of researcher are you as a designer? You know, what mm. tools are you interested in using? What um, critical issues are you interested in, in exploring? What Where do you want what you do to matter? You know, and, and how? And again, it doesn't have to be political engagement. It doesn't have to be, you know, citizenship in the literal sense, but it's about, you know, where does this fit? How does it work? Um, And how do you make it work? How do you think about it as well? How do you think about what you're doing? How do you do what you're thinking? I I just, um, yeah, they're they're definitely interlinked. And in ways that aren't necessarily easy to articulate because you're either saying it, I mean, yeah. Because just trying to say it in that way almost presupposes that there's a 
duality, that they're separate. And I think they're a lot more interlinked than the theory and practice, I mean, <laughs> making yeah, and no, thinking. It gets, it's, it's complex. So now I'm thinking when, when people, the wider public asks you, what do you do as a profession? How, <laughs> how do you answer this? I, I usually say I teach history and theory to design students, um, which tends to simplify things. <laughs> and um, I mean, and, and people, yeah, understand it in different ways. So people will say, oh, I loved history at school. Or people will say, oh, yes, um, I really like drawing. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think these are valid <laughs> yeah. reactions to, to my yeah. explanation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, now on a more professional, I mean, professional or more linked to history of graphic design specifically, how do we teach his the history of graphic design today? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we have this classical book written by Philip Meggs, but yeah, how do we move forward with this? You know, I mean, the book is definitely has um, uh, uh, gaps, you know, like that we are trying to fill in. Uh, while teaching these classes and so you know one of one idea would be to use uh, Lina Hakim's book on the <laughs> Al-Azawi <laughs> but you know like it's not just the material or the designers that we are bringing up in class but it's also the approach so maybe you can you know maybe you can tell us more about this you know? yeah this, happily mm -hmm. I mean um, I, you'll be happy to well I don't know or maybe interested or surprised to hear I don't teach Megs um, I don't teach. Yeah. Um, I don't teach any actually of the history books that I refer to. I don't even teach uh, Drucker and McFarish um, graphic design. You know their critical approach to graphic design history. I uh, tell the students where they can find them and ask them to go through them and read what they want. What I do <laughs> is um, is try to get them to think about how. Well, I start with, um, I'm just trying to, maybe I need to get a schedule out. I start yeah. by asking them, um, how, how do we, what, why do we study critical and historical studies of design, right? Why do we need to understand part, the narratives that are told about our discipline? Why do we need to understand the ideas that we used to make sense of it? That's where we start. And then we start talking about how histories of graphic design are written. So rather than take them through the books, I get them to and think about, um, to compare, for example, uh, Meg's approach to, um, who wrote a brief history of graphic design? Uh, uh, a concise uh, no, history thinking, of graphic design. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking Eskilson. There's Eskilson. No, not Eskilson. Yeah, I know. There's this, uh, this, uh, the series with, um, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, but anyway, we can, we, you know, like I, what I was thinking is, uh, 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 using chronology and which chronology and why, you know, do we have to abide by the chronology of the book? Or, you know, like what I'm doing is just, you know, a, 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 a chron chron chronologically addressing graphic design in a way, yeah. and not using yeah. the chronology that is set by the book. But, maybe, you know, and this brings me to the notion of modernity mm. or, you know, like we're addressing all these modernism okay yeah. So, yeah but then i would like to address modernism from an approach that uh, selwa rauda has written about selwa rauda yeah. shukair another book that yeah. is part of the series so this you know this is just chronology and how we approach chronology modernism the concept of modernism and and and, and, and again it brings me to do we really have to teach the bauhaus does the bauhaus <laughs> have to be part of this class i'm taking it as far yeah. as you know questioning yeah. you know yeah. teaching in beirut or uh, i don't know in uh, somewhere in the global south and you know mentioning the bauhaus to the students as a a an example to be followed i you know like a seminal example no absolutely i um so when covid happened and everything moved online with um our colleagues in the department of critical and historical studies at Kingston, we decided to try and use this as an opportunity. So what we did is put together a collaborative curriculum for um, history and theory of art and design. And we decided to push forward a decolonial agenda. Um, and the way in which we did that was um, using aspects of the chronology. So first doing that kind of meta discussion of practice 
Um, so that, let's say like the sessions I was telling you about, you know, why do we study critical and historical studies? Why is it important for our understanding of the discipline as practitioners? Then we think, how are these histories written? What's, you know, what's the difference between Megs and Hollis? What does it tell us about their understanding of design? What examples do they use, et cetera? And then how do we look at images? You know, how do we look at examples? How do we make sense of them? Um, how do we uh, um, use text to support our analysis of them, et cetera? And then we said, okay, so we need some sort of chronology. And if we begin with modernism, and you know, in some of these disciplines, so critical historical studies, my, my um, colleagues teach, teach it for fine arts students, photography students, uh, film students, illustration and animation students, uh, um, fashion, interiors, etc. How do we tell something that works across the board, but really critically um, unpacks <laughs> uh, 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 or, or interrogates the things that we use as reference? And so what we did was each one of us prepared one session. So the first session um, that introduced modernism um, and industrialization, let's say, uh, used also discussed the flip side of the coin, colonization and uh, migration. So, so the whole idea was to kind of decenter everything, um, to show the flip side of everything. Um, the session that was looking at uh, modernity in the city um, also looked at um, spectacle, um, uh, uh, you know, the way in which, uh, 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 you know, ideas of observation. And it took as its case study, um, oh, uh, I can't remember her name now. Anyway, so, so instead of, let's say, instead of talking about toulouse lautrec talking about Avril Lavigne as a performer, so kind of uh, 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 re-empowering uh, people who were subjects in the narratives. It wasn't ever Levine that I'm thinking of. I don't know why I can't remember her name now. Anyway, but that, yeah. that's the idea. And then, so for for example, when I did um, I did the session on the avant gardes and I, I just did discuss some of the historical European avant gardes but um, but my focus was first on definitions of the avant garde and how they can help us make sense of uh, practices, current, you know, historical and current practices of resistance on one hand, um, but also focused on the um, anthropophagic movement, um, the, you know, the, the cannibalistic anthropophagia in Brazil, which is mm -hmm. this kind of uh, <laughs> avant-garde that was all about um, hybridity and swallowing the other avant-gardes and kind of reclaiming these ideas of references. So rather than these avant-gardes, let's say, um, well, any of them, uh, referencing or using aspects of uh, the colonies or using uh, things from, you know, ethnographic objects as references to produce their new modern avant-garde, whatever approach, uh, reclaiming these things and kind of digesting them in their way and things like that. So, so it's not just about examples, but also where the focus is, how the story is told, still giving um, students a sense of what the references that other people will be telling them about are, still giving them the opportunity to look up the things. So, you know, go to Megs, go to Hollis, go to Eskilson, go to Drucker and McVarish. Um, mm. But you, you decide what you want to focus on. You think very clearly about what narrative you're saying about design. You think very clearly about what you're trying to, how you want your practice to be understood, what examples you want to be covered, etc. So definitely including examples from the Arab world is really important. Um, including examples from um, uh, Korea is really important. I mean, in terms of the, where, where a lot of our students are from, um, including, you know, so lots of, lots of bits that don't make it as part of the original canon. Uh, a colleague of mine did a session on the Bauhaus and it was really interesting because he did it on um, Bauhaus in India and it was absolutely oh. fantastic. And it wasn't this idea of a derivative Bauhaus. It was the way in which um, some ideas get uh, uh, picked up on, uh, how they become transformational, how they affect central movements or whatever the center is and things like that. I mean, I, I should, um, yeah, I can show you slides and things like that. It, it, was, it was really enjoyable. And of course, when things get, got back to normal, the program became a bit less collaborative. We still kept a couple of collaborative sessions. So for first year, we've got a common program, it's called where all of us teach and the students get to pick where, what they want to attend and they can attend as many sessions as they want. Um, but I think most of us have kind of stuck to this really 
decentralized, de decolonial approach. And to be honest, once we get to postmodernism, so we, we do two, three, I mean, this year I'm doing three, I guess, four historical sessions in the traditional sense. And after that, it becomes thematic. Yeah, I mean, this idea of decolonizing the, the, the curriculum or decentering the curriculum is really interesting and looking into, I don't know, the, the practice from a, a, the so-called periphery or, you know, like mm. that's really, yeah. I mean, that's, that's critical, teaching critical thinking in a way. I think and so, I, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's the well, bit that matters. I think it matters a lot more than knowing who was born when or, you know, oh, <laughs> when definitely. a particular piece oh, was definitely. made. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is what I meant when I said, you know, let's forget about the chronology and try to mm -hmm. look into, you know, the different, um, uh, 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 looking into it from a different approach. What about the gender component, Lena? Oh, yeah, it's what, huge. What, what, you know, like, what about, you know, this, you know, the, this, this, this historical uh, uh, narrative that uh, focuses on uh, mostly men? working as designers in the 50s and the 60s and yeah. even after that yeah so, what, what so, do you do so when, oh yeah i do a lot with that so the, that second session i told you about when we look about how the history is written we look about who it's written by <laughs> um, yeah. and who it's written for and what examples are there and i use the example of um again i'm sorry i'm missing all of my um uh references all of my names um who did uh who did what, research on the canon feminist graphic design historian um, and, and also we get them to read, you know, why are there no, no women in art history? Why, <laughs> why are the women in graphic yeah. design? That kind of thing. Linda um, so Nocklin. So we make sure we do that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, I mean, we, we basically showed, and do you know why we're doing it, do you mean? Because it sounds, some people say to me, isn't that too meta and too theoretical for the students? And it really is not. I mean, this is what they want. They respond mm. so much more to it. They're so interested. They're so engaged in class mm. in a way that I don't remember ever being in a history of design class, you know what I mean? Or a history of architecture is what we got. Um, you yeah, know, there were, there were lots of really interesting things, but it, it, it felt like we were learning. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it feels that, but maybe that's because I'm not a historian, right? <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I'm a bit less I'm interested in teaching history than teaching ways of thinking about historical narrative. Oh, definitely. I mean, now, and, and look, and you have the proof that your students are more interested in the material. And now I'm thinking maybe, I don't know, maybe you need a course on teaching graphic design across the border or, you know, <laughs> yeah. elsewhere, elsewhere, design elsewhere. Or we have this course I told you about graphic design in the Middle East. I, yeah. I mean, I don't know, you know, you, you're yeah. testing the ground. We're looking into, you know, is there an interest to learn more about this or not? Or you know, no, gra teaching graphic design in the global south or, yeah. No, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's something I think a lot about. And in fact, I think I, think I might have mentioned that to you before, but I'm looking at um, organizing uh, a research network, looking at, um, yes. uh, you know, what, what pedagogy, what design pedagogy in the Arab world should look like or could look like. To try to think about yeah questions around decolonization questions around the canon oh, questions definitely. around how we we understand practice and things like that so yeah i definitely <laughs> want to be part of it yes this research <laughs> this re i meant this research so yes. so this brings me to my to another question here that is a bit uh, sim simplistic what is the project you are most proud of and what um, is the project you most enjoy doing research about <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I'd call it research. Um, the project, I really like um, this, this article, this very brief article that I wrote that's called Things in Lockdown. Um, yeah, I saw Where it. I was, yeah. <laughs> so it was really, it was a reflection about, it was a bit about, of a reflection about what was happening <laughs> in lockdown. But it was also about how we make sense of that as, I guess, academic practitioners, as, as people who uh, think critically as um, um but also as people who are you know involved with well as parents in, in my case i was thinking a lot about how children become part of your practice your creative practice and your intellectual practice and and how that tends to be something that's hidden in the background i really enjoyed how uh, lockdown brought this to the foreground <laughs> i really enjoyed that all of my colleagues got to see my kids climbing on me 
uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I like this, <laughs> this forced intimacy. I just like that there was no, that, that the division of spheres was a bit blurrier. I, I like that we were made, we were forced to be made more aware of um, everything else that happens. Um, everything else that makes us the person who we are at work as well and I thought that was really interesting um, but I also like what well, or it's something I mean it's something I want to explore further it's something I haven't had a chance to explore in, in much depth but I'm really interested in this kind of creative collaboration you have with children and I don't just mean you know reading storybooks or drawing together or things like that but how much they um, interactions inform our way of thinking and our way of understanding and our way of doing things and, and I just found yeah I think that's why I enjoyed this article a lot um I don't know if I'd call it research in the strict sense <laughs> and in terms of a more researchy thing I really like looking into archives I really like making sense of things again it's that object-oriented approach to things um I like I really like theoretical analysis as well so I've been um, I've been thinking a lot for a while. I kind of I never have the time to spend the time that I need on it. But you know, André Breton, the surrealist um, author, an artist, and that's, yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been I've been looking at. I mean, I want to put together a critical translation of some of his texts or an annotated translation of some of his texts because I think he's really useful for thinking about material culture today. I just find his mm. his um, um, he's got this text called Crisis of the Object that I just think is fantastic to make sense of the way in which we understand things. So I, I, I like, I really enjoy super theoretical research as well. Um, I enjoy trying to make sense of archive. I enjoy um, um, the opportunity to collate or make visible archives as well. I mean, I know that where you are involved, um, lots of people we know are involved in trying to collate um, Arabic illustration, Arabic children's books, that kind of thing. So that's always, yeah, that's always a drive, I guess. <laughs> so what is it about your research work that you find most difficult? Time. I, I don't, um, 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 I guess, I don't know if that's what's difficult about the work itself or about life. <laughs> I just never have the time to do things properly. Um, and sometimes I just don't have to do the time to do things at all. I think there's um, been, in the world, a bit of a devaluation of um, intellectual labor <laughs> that is kind of uh, making it difficult um, to allocate the time that you need for this kind of work. I mean, I also understand that it's a privilege to have time for this kind of work, but I think it's necessary. And I still think it is work. Um, and, and as such, you know, it should be rewarded as labor. Um, I, think, I think that would be the difficult aspect. Is that a fair answer? I'm not sure. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm following you and I'm thinking now about this next question here. What do you imagine will be important in design education in the coming 10 to 20 years? I mean, what would be the changes in, or, I mean, we've, we've talked about some of them, but I don't know, how do you see the, the, this? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I've, I find that it's evolving so quickly. I mean, and you probably see it that. Is. It's oh, amazing yeah. how, how much better our students are getting, <laughs> how much more in, more in touch with things, how much more um, critically aware, I guess, m more capable. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm always in awe of, of my students. I'm always amazed by what they're able to do. I'm always, I'm always really impressed by the kind of dissertation projects they come up with. Um, the methods that they decide to employ is things like autoethnography, for instance. Um, these kinds of methods are really on the rise now. So students really aware about situating themselves in terms of the research and practice, uh, really bringing in their voice as something significant and to make sense of in terms of theoretical debate. Um, I think they're also very more and more aware of uh, um, opportunities offered by that kind of loose definition of design practice. Um, so the way in which they can shape it into whatever they want. I don't know, I'm always, I'm always so impressed by my students. <laughs> I, lo I love it when, I love their degree shows um, when they're finishing, but I love hearing back from them, you know, a few years after they've graduated. And it, it's really amazing to see what they're doing. And it's yeah. always amazing to see how, yeah, how much more engaged students, come, incoming students are as well. Um, 
where where is it going i yeah i don't <laughs> i don't know i mean i'd like to think in terms of uh, our region, and again, I don't mean the UK. I mean in terms of Lebanon and the Arab world. I'd like to, I'd like to see more, you know, narratives that kind of, or more local narratives emerge. You know, without excusing themselves, without having to negotiate their position into in relation to more standard narratives, maybe, or in terms of a Western canon, which, as you say, is quite white, quite male, quite Eurocentric, etc. And yeah, and I think it, I mean it's definitely happening here. So we should take advantage of that in in Lebanon in the Arab world. I think. Um, what about print? Do you think the end of print is near? And what do you think <laughs> the alternative will be? <laughs> uh, I don't think the end of print is near at all. I mean, I think I think there are lots of things that we don't print anymore, and that we probably don't need to print. I don't think. Um, I can't remember the last time I read a newspaper, not on, you know, not digitally. Probably if somebody forgot it on a bus or on the train, that's, <laughs> I don't think, yeah, I can't remember the last time I bought a newspaper. Um, but I mean, if I turn the screen around, you'll see in any direction, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm carrying my laptop and I'm showing Yasmin, I mean, it's books everywhere. Um, yeah. So as someone who spends uh, <laughs> so much time <laughs> getting I these see. things, <laughs> I, I, I don't see. think it's, I think it's something, again, you know, I'm biased. I'm interested in things. I'm interested in materiality. I think the experience of leafing through something that's printed, feeling particular paper textures, um, looking at things without that kind of glow of screens is, um, yeah, it's, it's special. Good. This is reassuring to me. I can show you around my my <laughs> shelves over there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we're always. Is, is, does anyone? Yeah, I don't know. Does anyone you ask as part of the series think that it's the end of print? No, but that's no. why we have this question to end. <laughs> you know, in a way, we want to reassure people that print <laughs> is not an, it in be any way. You know, a lot of um, a lot of my students are really interested in this question of the post digital, um, which, as a critical theme, I think is quite interesting. So this idea of what comes after, you know, not just after the digital and chronological term, but this idea of not thinking of the digital as something that's new, and and you know, working with hybridity or working mm -hmm. um, across these or thinking, you know bringing in the things that the digital is meant to um, do away with, like noise and friction, and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, Podcast. advantage of it. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so while we're wrapping up uh, today's amazing session, I'm going to ask you if you want to add anything, any final word or thought you would like to leave us with. I mean, I think I think it's great that you're doing this series. I think yeah. it's nice um, to hear from practitioners and um, thinkers, I guess, in the area. I think it's nice to have that kind of record. I think it's a way of having a dialogue as well. Um, obviously, a dialogue between the two of us, but just having these conversations somewhere. I don't know how, yeah. how useful this one will be, but <laughs> yeah, I hope it is. Um, and being heard. Being heard, yeah, being and heard commented is good. on, yeah. <laughs> but it's always, I mean, it's always enjoyable to have a chat as well. Yes, man, it's really nice talking to you. It was really nice talking to you too, Lena. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.